Hi, welcome to Pyrography Made Easy. I'm Brenda. So a bit back, Good Crafters contacted me and wanted me to review their pyrography machine. Well, it came in. The box isn't very big, but I'm really excited to open this up, see what all is in there, and test it out. So let's get started. Unboxing. The box isn't very big. It measures 11 and a half by 7 by 4 inches. The first thing I discover is the packing slip and the instruction manual. After that, I find a package of plastic stencils. So far, I am rather impressed with the packaging design. On the left, there are two packages of plywood squares and a plastic tray. To the right is another package of plywood squares pliers, a small sponge, two set screws, a cardboard box that contains the burner, there's also a couple more stencils, the metal handset rest, a tiny screwdriver, a small tin that holds the wire tips, and the two handsets. The handset on the right is for wire tips, and the one on the left is for the solid metal brass tips. The inset box contains a plastic case filled with brass tips. It also contains the control unit for this burner. It is rather amazing to me that they got all of this stuff to fit in that little box. The instruction manual isn't very big, and it contains pretty basic information. The stencils include a lowercase alphabet, plus one with numbers and symbols. Then there is an assortment of themed stencils. Combined, there is a total of 12 plastic stencils. Each packet of plywood contains five pieces, for a total of 15 small boards that measure 2 and 3 quarter inches square. Also included in the kit is a Phillips head screwdriver, and a set of pliers. The wire tips come in a metal tin that has a piece of double-sided tape on the bottom. The kit includes 20 wire tips. There is a plastic box that has removable compartment walls. There are 21 decorative brass tips, 29 other brass tips, and one X-Acto knife kit. That gives a total of 53 pieces. Physical size. The front of the burner measures 4 and 1 8 inches wide. There is a strange compartment on the left side of the machine. I asked Good Crafter what its purpose was, and I was told that the compartment is just a styling design and has no other use. When I include this side compartment to the measurements, the width of the machine increases to 5 inches. The machine measures five and a half inches long or deep. This is including the knobs but not the power cord. The machine measures three and three eighths inches tall and it weighs 2.37 pounds or 1,075 grams. The power cord measures 39 and one half inches long. That is from the base where it emerges out of the machine to the end of the plug-in, but it does not include the prongs. The plastic tray holder is 2 and 5 8 inches wide at its narrowest and 2 and 7 8 inches wide at the tabs, where it is the widest. It is 6 and 1 8 inches long and 1 and a half inches tall at the back. The metal handset holder is 5 and 3 8 inches long. The front of the holder measures 3 inches wide and the opening of the plastic inserts is 7 8 inch diameter. Assembled, the unit measures 6 inches tall and 11 and 1 quarter inches tall with the handsets in place. The brass tip handset measures 6 and 7 8 inches long. The power cord is 43 and 1 half inches long and the handle circumference is 3 and 3 quarter inches. The wire tip handset is 5 and 1 8 inches long. 
The power cord is 44 inches long, and it has a circumference of 3.5 inches. The brass tip holder on the right is longer and a touch thicker than the wire tip holder on the left. Assembly Assembling the parts together is very easy and intuitive. The tray does not have to be connected to the machine, and it is fairly stable without the handsets. But when the handsets are in place, it becomes tipsy. I had a difficult time removing a handset without securing the base with my other hand. The set screw for the tray is already attached to the machine, so it needs to be removed. The screwdriver they supplied did not work for this, so I used a different one that I already owned. The tray fits perfectly onto the top of the machine, and the set screw locks it into place. Once the tray is secured, it is strong enough to hold the weight of the machine. The metal handset holder slides into the groove on the tray, and the handsets fit snugly into the metal holder. One thing I like is that the more delicate wire tips don't touch the metal holder. The brass handset cord has a four-prong plug-in. Align the top notch and then press it firmly onto the machine. Afterwards, tighten the threaded coupler. The wire tip handset has a two-prong receptacle that plugs into the machine. First, pull back the plastic covering, align the notches, and push it firmly onto the machine. Then tighten the threaded coupler and put the plastic cover back in place. That's it, we're done. My modifications. The first thing I did was use a white gel pen to draw over the indicator marks on the dials. This made it much easier for me to see where they were set to. I did mention this to Good Crafter, and they liked the idea and might change their knobs in future models. The next thing I did was organize the pen tips. The containers provided in the kit are great for storage, but I like to be able to see all of the pen tips. Once I was done organizing and grouping the pen tips, I had three sets. One, the decorative brass tips. Two, the other brass tips. And three, the wire tips. Each group was placed in a piece of foam I recycled from a tool order that Todd got. I just cut out small pieces of the foam with a sharp knife. The wire tips can be pushed into the foam. The brass tips, I first cut a small incision, and that's enough to hold the tips in place. This method keeps everything secure, organized, and easy for me to see. Most wire tips are flat or straight. I tried using a couple of them this way, but I don't burn on gourds or 3D objects. Instead, I burn on flat boards, so this style of tip just didn't work well for me. To fix, I first fill the tip to see if one side is smoother than the other. Then I select the smoothest side of the tip to be the burner side. I use pliers to bend the tip to a 45 degree angle, making sure that the smooth side is on the bottom because that will be the side in contact with the wood. That slight modification to the tips makes it easier and more comfortable for me to burn. I cut a larger piece of foam to fit the bent tips. This made it easier to select and replace one. Another thing I did was create a micro rider. When I'm working on small, extremely detailed stuff, I want a pen tip that I can be super precise with. I started out with a regular writer pen tip, and I used pliers to squish the two wires together. I had to use two sets of pliers to keep the pen tip from twisting as I was squishing it. Then I rubbed the tip on a metal needle file to grind it down to a smaller size. Todd bought this set at Harbor Freight, and they cost less than $5. It doesn't take long to reshape the tip. In 48 seconds, I had significantly thinned one side of it. In all, it took me less than five minutes to transform this writer pin tip into a micro writer. 
Both handsets twist off, exposing the heating element. When mine arrived, they were both a little loose, so make sure the handset is firmly in place before you use it. After a few uses, it will probably tighten up to the point you can't twist it off. To equip a wire tip, first loosen the set screws. I discovered that the provided screwdriver didn't fit these screws either. The company is aware of the problem and has probably fixed the issue. After the set screws are loosened, then insert the wire tip into the receptacle and tighten up the set screws. Sometimes I have difficulties getting a used wire tip to insert into the receptacle. Most likely I didn't loosen the set screws enough, or I've got the tip angled and it's catching on one of the set screws. Regardless, I've found that if I straighten the ends of the wire tip, then it will slide down into the receptacle. The brass tips are very easy to equip because they just screw into the receptacle. It takes approximately one minute for a wire tip to cool down to a touchable temperature. If I'm burning and I want a different tip equipped, I don't have the patience to wait. I turn off the power, loosen the set screws, and pull out the tip with pliers. Then I place the hot tip into the metal canister lid. If you do this, be careful not to touch the metal receiver because it can be very hot. Also, I would not recommend doing this with the brass tips. I have read several cases about the base of the tips breaking off in the receiver when they were removed before the metal had cooled. Always wait until the brass tip has cooled before you replace it. To clean a pin tip, gently rub it over a strop that has some polishing compound on it. I use the Charpel brand. Once the tip is clean, then rub it over the uncoated portion of the strop to remove any residual compound. I clean the brass tips the same way. I do recommend keeping the tip in the handset when you clean it. I had just used the burner for something else, and I didn't want to wait for it to cool down so I could put this pin tip back in there. And obviously I forgot to clean it before I removed it. Dual Pins Test Good Crafter advertises that you can power both handsets at the same time. I powered them up and got the heat adjusted. Then I checked each handset. Yes, they both work. In fact, you can use both of them simultaneously. Obviously, I can't do this with any amount of precision, but it is possible to do this with the machine. Next, I wanted to see if the burn results stayed consistent if both sides of the machine were powered on. I started burning with a brass tip. I was getting very dark burn results. Then I powered on the wire tip side. I had the heat set as high as it would go. I continued burning with the brass tip, but I couldn't see a difference in the output. Afterwards, I turned off the wire tip side and continued burning. Again, I could not detect a tonal change in the burn results. I repeated the test, but this time I started out with the wire tip side. I am using a large pen tip that I know can handle the maximum heat setting without turning red. With this tip, any loss of power should be noticeable. Like before, I was getting very dark burn results. Then I powered on the brass tip side and kept burning. I knew it would take a little bit for the brass tip side to heat up, so I continued to burn while it did so. After it got up to heat, I did not notice a change in the darkness level of the burns. Lastly, I grabbed both handsets and did some more burning while they were really good and hot. I got dark burn results from both pens. The machine passed this test with flying colors. Tonal Range The brass tip side of Good Crafter's burner has a range of 200 to 480 degrees Celsius, or 392 to 896 degrees Fahrenheit. The wire tip side ranges from 250 to 750 degrees Celsius, 
or 482 to 1,382 degrees Fahrenheit. With that range of power output, I should be able to get a large variety of color. I've got a piece of birch plywood, and I'm testing the wire tips first. I started out with a clean pin tip and had the heat set at the lowest setting of 250 degrees. After 20 seconds, I'm checking to see if there's any noticeable burn results. If not, I increase the heat by 25 degrees, and I continue this until I can detect a burn result. After a noticeable burn result is achieved, I note the temperature and write it below the test burn. Then I continue to incrementally increase the heat by 25 degrees and create a small test burn for each temperature setting. I stop the test if the pen tip begins to glow red or if I reach the maximum heat setting. With the wire tips, I only tested tips that were different. For example, there are two of these half circles. One of them has a rounded wire and the other is flat. To me, that qualifies as being different. On the flip side, some of the pen tips were extremely similar like these flat shaders, or the pointed shaders. In cases like this, I only tested one of the pin tips. I also tested the brass tips. I was more selective with them because there were so many. I ended up testing the ones I thought I would probably use in pyography, and a couple of the decorative stamp tips. Testing the brass tips is very time-consuming because they take longer to heat up and forever to cool down. I will go into detail on this in the next chapter. Another tonal range test was done on watercolor paper. I have no idea what brand I'm burning on. I made a grid, started out the temperature at the lowest setting, waited 15 seconds, and checked for noticeable burn results. From there, I kept increasing the heat by 25 degrees and waiting for 15 seconds before I tested the pin tip. I used the same testing methods on a piece of leather. With both the paper and the leather, I only tested two tips, a writer and a shader. When I started testing the brass tips, I got smart and tested the paper and leather together. This saved some time. I only tested two of the brass tips, a calligraphy tip and a writer tip. The wire tips perform very well on wood. The smaller ones created a tan color starting around 275 to 350 degrees, and they all produced a very dark brown burn result. Of the large tips, all of them except one started producing a tan color in the 425 to 550 degree range. Only three of the large tips did not produce a really dark brown burn result. The brass tips I tested did okay. All of them produced a tan color somewhere between 325 to 400 degrees. Not all of them produced really dark burn results, but the majority of them did. It takes a higher heat for both wire and brass tips to burn on paper. The couple of tips that I tested on paper did just fine. Leather, on the other hand, needs a much lower heat setting. And again, the tips that I tested performed extremely well. All of the test burn panels that I did will be available on my website if you want to look at them in closer detail. Warm up. I let the pin tip cool down completely from the tonal range test. Afterwards, I cleaned the pin tip. Then I timed how long it took to heat back up to a predetermined value. Once the pin tip began to produce a noticeable tan color, I noted the time and wrote it down. You may have noticed a box was drawn around one result on every row of the tonal range test. Every single pin tip that was tested in the last chapter was tested in this one. The wire tips ranged between 14 and 21 seconds to warm up. This was the fastest wire tip at 14 seconds, and these three wire tips were tied for the longest at 21 seconds. 
The brass tips ranged between 47 seconds and 1 minute and 31 seconds to warm up. This brass tip was the fastest at 47 seconds, and this one the slowest at 1 minute and 31 seconds. Cool down. After I did the warm up test, I immediately did a cool down test on the pin tip. I used a digital thermometer and held the probe near the end of the tip. Then I waited until the temperature declined to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I did this test for every single wire tip that I tested in the previous two chapters. What I discovered is it took the wire tips between 1 minute and 8 seconds and 1 minute and 33 seconds to cool down. Fastest cool down tip was this one at 1 minute and 8 seconds, and the longest cool down tip was this one at 1 minute and 33 seconds. The brass tips I knew would take a lot longer to cool down, so I rigged up this high tech system to test them out. I will admit right now that I did not have the patience to test every brass tip. Not to mention, I did not want to waste that much video time. So I tested five random tips. Two of those pin tips were double tested. The second test was done with the tip in the metal holder. The metal acts as a heat sink, and I wanted to see how much time it saved during the cooldown process. These are the five tips I tested and the time it took in minutes to cool down. The two on the right were double tested. The second number is how long it took the tip to cool down while it was in the metal holder. Using the metal holder reduces the cool down time by a fair amount, but it's still a long time. Learning the pin tips. I wasn't familiar with the majority of the pin tips found in Good Crafters kit. There were only a couple, like this shader, that I felt comfortable with and knew what it could do. To help me learn the capabilities of the assorted pin tips, I created a grid filled with squares. In each square, I drew a design from one of the included stencils. Then I selected a pin tip and tested out my four basic burn strokes, circular motion, uniform strokes, pull away strokes, and zigzags. Depending on the pin tip, I also burned some thin lines or created dots. Then I burned in the stencil design. I tried to incorporate shading and different textures into the design burn. The reason is that this would be a lot more helpful in discovering what the pin tip can do versus burning the design to a uniform color. Plus, this is a good way to let your imagination roam free. Don't be afraid to experiment. I am using the edge of this brass tip to see how well it would burn along the edge of a board. It didn't do as well as I had hoped. With a better setup, I think I could get more consistent results. I got very creative with the decorative brass tips. I used them as stamps. I dragged them across the board. I overlapped burn marks. I created repeating designs. I used them in circular motion, and so on. My goal was to see if there was a pleasing pattern I could use as a border accent, or maybe an interesting texture that could be used as a background. Here are my pin tip discovery boards after I was done. Creating these really helped me better understand the capabilities of the different pin tips. I highly recommend you do something similar. Pin tips of note. This flat shader is one of my favorites. It's great for creating textures and smooth color in small to medium areas. I also really like this pointed shader. I can angle the pin to use the point, and this allows me to do very precise work. I like to use this pin tip when working on objects with convoluted edges or objects that have a small item I need to avoid burning over. These two large wire tips are awesome for working in medium to large spaces. The front edge of the tips are small enough to get close to objects with precision. The large side edges are fantastic for quickly filling in backgrounds. 
This small brass tip is great for working in small areas and drawing fine lines. I also like it because it doesn't catch on plywood's missing slivers of wood. A green arrow is pointing to a missing sliver of wood on this piece of plywood. This solid, round, flat-top brass tip was interesting. As a stamp, it's not all that spectacular, but you can use it to transfer printouts created with toner printers. Place the image down on the board, gently rub over it with the brass tip, remove the paper from the board to reveal the transferred image. Compatibility Another thing I tested was Good Crafter's compatibility with other brands of pen tips. I bought a set of alphabet stamps from some random seller on Amazon. The tips easily screw onto the handset, heat up within the same time frame as all the other tips I tested, and produced a nice clean stamped image. I also purchased a set of wire tips that were rated for machines that work between 30 and 50 watts. I picked this particular set because it had a different pen tip from those included in the Good Crafter kit, this ball tip. I had no problems with the tip inserting into the handset or with it heating up. The tip produced great burn results. Good Crafter's Pyography Machine has passed the compatibility test. Three things I would change. One, a longer power cord. The length of the power cord and the height of my art table are the same, so the power cord doesn't reach the floor, let alone the power outlet. So I would like a longer power cord. Two, swiveling handsets. To me, the front of the burner feels cluttered with the handset cords dangling in front of it, so it would be great if the handsets could be repositioned. Three, switch sides. The last thing that I would like is for the wire control side to be on the left. The burner sits to the right of my easel, and I use the wire tip side the most. So for me, it would be more convenient if it was on the left side of the machine. Moon and Stars on Leather Now that I've finished all the preliminary testing, it's time to put Good Crafter's machine through its paces and create some artwork. I'm starting out with a very simple design on leather. I'm using a number of different pen tips because I'm trying to figure out what works best for me on this medium. While I don't have a definitive answer on that, I can tell you that all of the pen tips I used glided over the surface of the leather with ease. So far, so good. On to art project number two. Butterfly on leather. Now I'm burning a butterfly on leather. I was making a leather cell phone holder for Todd, but I messed up and it was too small. In the end, this worked out because I used it for testing with the Good Crafters machine. Once again, I am really impressed with how the pen tips perform on leather. Even when I'm burning dark, they don't stick. I think the decorative brass tips have a lot of potential as accents on leather. I would have to say that Good Crafter's Pyography Machine passed the leather test with flying colors. Orchid on paper. I also created some artwork on watercolor paper to see how the Good Crafter burner would handle that. Paper is like leather in that it's not very forgiving so it's difficult to fix mistakes. Where paper is really different from leather is how it needs a much higher heat to produce burn results. For this project, I only used three pen tips, the flat shader with a rounded tip, the flat shader with a pointed tip, and the small rounded brass tip writer. All of the tips performed wonderfully. They glided smoothly over the paper, and I was able to create a beautiful piece of artwork that has wonderful tonal variety and details. So the burner passes the paper test. Carnival Mask on Wood The Carnival Mask was my big grand finale of the testing process. The mask has a lot of complex design elements, 
and an assortment of textures that needed to be replicated. This provided an excellent challenge to see if the good crafter pyography machine could handle it. Obviously, it did. The texture of the plywood I'm burning on is terrible. You can see a lot of deep missing slivers of wood. I discovered that tips with fine points didn't work as well as the more rounded points on this wood. Some of the ribbon pieces were rather large, and I discovered that the larger wire tips worked great on them. They glided over the wood with ease, and I was able to quickly burn in the areas. They quickly became some of my favorite pen tips. I really enjoyed creating the carnival mask artwork, and I think it turned out wonderfully. Pros and Cons First, the pros. Both handsets can be powered up simultaneously. There wasn't a loss of power or burn capacity when both handsets were powered up, even when they were on the maximum heat settings. The burner is compatible with other brands of pen tips. The large foam grips are comfortable. I think people with larger hands or those with arthritis would appreciate the handsets. The handsets have a very thick, insulating layer of foam. I never felt any warmness from the handsets, even after burning dark for an extended period of time. The machine is very easy to assemble and operate. The kit includes a lot of stuff. It is an awesome value. All of the pen tips were able to create a wide range of tonal values. The pen tips glided smoothly over leather without sticking, even on high heat. I didn't experience any problems with the machine during my many hours of testing and creating artwork. The Cons For me, the power cord is not long enough. The screwdriver didn't fit any of the screws. Good Crafter is aware and is fixing or has fixed the issue. The handset holder tray is tipsy if not attached to the burner. And I didn't care for the handset cords dangling in front of the machine. It just made it feel cluttered. Well, that is it for this video. I have to say that the machine did awesome. I was able to create some great artwork. It performed well on leather, wood, and paper. You can't ask for more than that. And for all of the stuff that you get, this is an awesome value. I have no problem recommending it. On my website, Pyography Made Easy, I do have the written version of this review, and I will put a link to that in the description below. And I will also have a link to the Good Crafter Pyography Machine in the description below. Well, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next week.